So it's my pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about brain injury. Um, so you already heard about the topic. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, it looks, it's a lot worse than it looks. Um, the reality is, is that it's very expensive to do brain injury research, so we have a lot of funding sources in the lab. Um, he already mentioned that brain injury is the number one cause of death and disability in Americans under the age of 35. It's also the number one cause of premature death and disability in the world. Um, Minnesota is one of about five states where falls are the number one cause of brain injury. And why is that? It's because uh, a majority of the year, or sometimes it seems like a majority of the year, a portion of the year, it's, uh, there's a lot of ice and uh, there's a big reason to fall. So people who are deconditioned are more likely to fall and that's obviously a, a big problem here. Uh, and so that's why we have to you know, be aware of that. Um, motor vehicle accidents are the number two cause and then accidents in general are the number three cause. Uh, and, and these numbers are, are fairly similar in other states, but uh, the, the Midwest tends to have a tendency to have more falls. Uh, this is the CDC data that was last updated in 2010 on their website, um, where they look at the number of hospitalizations um, for, um, for brain injury. And you can see that the number is steadily rising and it's been rising more recently because there's increased awareness of the problem and that's because of football and the military. Um, and then the interesting thing about this is is that at least among children and probably much more so among adults, the majority of people who sustain a brain injury actually never go to the emergency room. They end up staying home, they think that there's nothing the emergency room would do anyway. People tend to go to the emergency room when they think they have a life-threatening injury but not for just a general brain injury and then they let their symptoms fester for a few days and if they don't get better then they'll go to their primary care doctor and they'll say well I think I hit my head and I think I might have a brain injury so 80 percent of people don't go to the emergency room and therefore they're not captured in those CDC numbers so the number he just gave you when he was introducing me about 330 something thousand Americans having a brain injury those are CDC numbers um, and it doesn't include all of these patients um, you would think that with brain injury being such a huge problem that we'd have really great and effective ways of treating it. Uh, and the reality is it couldn't be, um, it couldn't be more false. Um, at least 30 different clinical trials for brain injury multicenter randomized prospective trials since 1992 have failed. And they've looked at things like hypothermia and temperature control, um, things like steroids, um, surgical intervention, hyperbaric oxygen, hypertonic saline, um, monitoring the intracranial pressure um, and decompressing the skull, um, you know, to see how these interventions can improve outcomes after brain injury. And it turns out that none of these randomized controlled trials have really shown really spectacular results. So what you have in the end is $1.1 billion on failed clinical trials for brain injury. And that's a heck of a lot of money. So we have to sort of think, hey, what are we doing wrong here? Why, why are things, you know, so confusing? Um, uh, if you look at these 30 failed trials, how are they classifying the patients for inclusion? They're classifying them mostly on the basis of physical exam. So the Glasgow Coma Scale Score is a proxy for physical exam. It's a, it's a standardized physical exam measure. And then we're classifying outcomes on the basis of Glasgow Outcome Scale Score, which is another proxy for physical exam. Uh, and so basically what we're doing is we're taking all the patients who got hit in the head and we're entering them in a clinical trial and we're treating them all exactly the same way, and then we're trying to see if they get, if some of them get better, or if, or if enough of them get better to get a statistically significant result. So that would be the equivalent of taking all the patients who present to the emergency room with chest pain and saying, okay, if you have chest pain, we're gonna call that mild, moderate, or severe based on you know, how much you're clutching your chest and gasping for air. And then we're going to put you in a clinical trial and we're going to see if you get better. And suppose you say, okay, we'll anticoagulate you, right? Well, what's going to happen? All the patients with heart attacks are going to get better. And all the patients with pulmonary embolisms are going to get better. But all the patients with dissecting aneurysms are going to die, right? So that's what we're doing with brain injury. We're taking mixed pathophysiology, we're treating it all the same way, and then we're expecting the clinical trials to work. And obviously they don't work. And that's, that's really the fundamental problem. So we have a big problem. Our problem is, is that we don't have good objective measures for brain injury. So what do we do right now? How do we assess a brain injured patient? Assuming that it's a, a relatively severely brain injured patient, um, you know, they come in usually from e emergency medical services. 
Um, and then so we asked them, you know, the emergency medical team, we say, what kind of accident was it? Single car accident is an impaired driver until proven otherwise. Um, you know, is it a multiple car accident? Restrained versus unrestrained, helmeted versus not, duration of extrication, all of these things affect outcome. What medications were the, was the patient given, you know, in the field? Where were they intubated? Where did they have the artificial airway placed? How, how was their blood pressure and their heart rate? If they had no blood pressure, they weren't giving oxygen to their brain. And then how were the other victims? If the other victims were really impaired, then you know, it's more likely that our patient was, was impaired. And then we ask about things like review of systems, um, meds, allergies, past medical history, and we, we check the patient's wallet, but you know, ultimately we don't even know if that's their own wallet. So you know, all those things are, you're sort of unable to obtain. You know, when you're dealing with a trauma patient, you don't have a lot to go on. Here's our Glasgow Coma Scale. Basically, um, it's a 3 to 15, so you get three points just for showing up, even if you're dead. Um, and it, it, you get four points for eyes, um, five points for verbal, and six points for motor. So your top score is 15. Um, your average drunk person comes in usually around a 13, so you lose two points for intoxication on average. Um, and, and then the rest of it goes from there. And if you, if you look at the guidelines um, um, for you know, how you use the GCS, people tend to think of GCS less than eight as being either minimally conscious or comatose. Um, so what do you do with those patients? You get a CAT scan, right? Why a CAT scan? A CAT scan because it's quick, um, because it will tell you if there's bleeding in the brain, it will tell you if there's a surgical emergency, it will tell you where that surgical emergency is in the brain and how you can deal with it. So that's why you get a CAT scan. You don't get an MRI because, number one, it takes a really, really long time um, it's actually dangerous to put a patient who has an acute brain injury flat for that long. Um, and number two, it doesn't tell you anything differently that's, it doesn't give you better information than a CT scan for trauma. It may give you better information for stroke or for something else, but it will not give you better information for trauma. Um, so if you Google, if you don't know anything about brain injury, and you Google on Wikipedia, you look it up, you know, brain injury, what does it say? It says this is the classification system for, for brain injury. It's mild, moderate, and severe, and it's a function of your GCS, whether you're amnestic for the event, and whether or not you've had loss of consciousness. But the problem with this is that loss of consciousness can occur for a lot of reasons. In 50% of people, the loss of consciousness happens because you're intoxicated. Um, and you know, it can also happen because you're polytrauma. So you, you may have gotten hit by a car, and you may have fallen and you broke your femur and you, you know, ruptured your spleen and your blood pressure's, you know, 40 over palp, and that's why you're unconscious. It's nothing to do with whether or not you have a brain injury. Um, and the other part, part of the problem with this scale is that lack of loss of consciousness does not equate with milder injury, either short or long term. So you can have a patient who falls and hits their head or something falls on their head and they never lose consciousness and they still have a brain injury. Um, and, and so that's why this whole scheme falls apart. Mild, moderate, and severe doesn't actually work. Here's an example. This is a 37-year-old woman who was at home and she fell. Um, she hit her head and she had no symptoms whatsoever. She had no headache, no other problems. She didn't go to the doctor because she had no reason to. She had no loss of consciousness. She had no symptoms whatsoever. Then over two weeks, she started to develop a very slight headache that got progressively worse. So she took some aspirin. And then what happened is all of a sudden she started slurring her speech. And then she went to the emergency room. And when they scanned her in the emergency room, they saw this. So she's got this great big subdural you know, fluid collection. And she basically has a potentially fatal brain injury that doesn't meet the definition of brain injury, right? because she never changed her GCS, she was never amnestic, and she never lost consciousness. So essentially, we've, we've got a scaling system here that just doesn't work. And you know, this is, what is, this is the American College of Rehab Medicine um, scale for brain injury, mild, moderate, and severe. But what do we do? What's wrong? How do we fix this, right? So why is concussion and brain injury so hard to diagnose and define? Um, as he mentioned, no two brain injuries are the same, and similar symptoms can have multiple causes. So you can get someone who's hit in the head, right? And they may not actually, and they may have, maybe they have a headache afterwards, or they have nausea and vomiting or dizziness or something like that, or balance problems. They may not actually have a brain injury. They may have a neck injury. At least 17% or 17 to 20% of brain injuries are comorbid with a neck injury. And you can have, you can have spasms in your neck, 
You can have um, vascular problems in your neck. You can have a spinal cord injury that mimics a brain injury. Um, and you can have like a carotid or a vert dissection that mimics a brain injury. So you can have a neck problem completely independent of your brain problem or comorbid with your brain problem that's mimicking the exact same symptoms. You can have an inner ear injury that classically causes vestibular dysfunction and dizziness. You can have endocrine dysfunction. So you typically see this in the patient who's in a high velocity car accident and they're wearing their seatbelt. Um, but even, even though they're wearing the seatbelt and they have an airbag, when the car goes from you know 60 miles per hour to zero miles per hour over two and a half seconds, what happens is, is their, their head jerks forward and backward and then it catches the headrest, right? And that happens at a high speed, right? And they never hit their head. Their head does not hit the dashboard, and they, they go into the emergency room, and maybe they get a CAT scan, or maybe they don't, but you know the ER doc says to them, boy, are you lucky? You dodged a bullet. You don't have a brain injury. And then what actually happened is, with that high velocity, they sheared their pituitary off their hypothalamus, and so they have a cortisol deficiency, or they have other endocrine deficiencies that show up later. And this may not manifest itself for several weeks after a brain injury. So this is something that can potentially get worse over time. Um, another type of injury that's invisible on imaging and not you know, detectable, generally speaking, is cortical spreading depression. And that typically happens with a focal blow to the head. So someone gets hit in the head, right? And then what happens is you get a local disruption of electrolyte channels, you know, where your ions go in and out of your neurons in one tiny little area. And you're asymptomatic at the time. You may have no headache whatsoever after you get hit in the head. And then down the road, two, three, four, five weeks later, or even a month later, what happens is because of that tiny little abnormality, it, the adjacent neurons compensate for the deficit. And that there's a phenomenon called kindling, and it spreads throughout your brain. And what it can lead to, it's the number one cause of post-concussive migraine. It can lead to seizures, and it can actually lead to stroke. Um, and so these are the patients who get worse after a brain injury. And the irony of this is that it's treatable. Um, the other thing that we know about cortical spreading depression is that it's mostly genetic. People who have a history of migraines are much, much more susceptible. So you probably see patients um, who, you know, presented with a brain injury and then have persistent symptoms or worsening symptoms over time. Chances are they were genetically more likely to, to have cortical spreading depression abnormalities. Um, then we have the neurosurgical spectrum of injury. So we have scalp injury. Those, these are the things that you can easily see. We have skull injury. So you get a CT scan and you see a fracture. And, you know, those are nice because you can fix them. Um, you have bleeding on the surface of the brain, either above or below the dura. Um, and then you have bleeding within the brain, the subarachnoid space or in the intraventricular space. And the, the problem with bleeding in the brain is that it's not always the, the, there's not only the acute bleeding that you have to worry about, which can cause mass effect, you know, it can expand and press on normal brain and, and actually cause death. Um, but it's also the delayed consequence, right? So you can have blood microhemorrhage in your brain, you know, even from a concussion, and you don't see it on conventional imaging. And what happens is that blood over time breaks down, that iron that deposits in your brain causes problems down the road. That's thought to be one of the number one causes of atrophy in the brain. Um, and we, we had a study that we performed at the Veterans Hospital looking at literally thousands of CT scans, and we showed that the more blood that you have in your brain, the more likely you are to develop atrophy. And the atrophy rates can be even higher than for dementia. So this is where you get your motor disorders and your, and your um, other dementing disorders after brain injury. Um, diffuse axonal injury, stretching or tearing of neurons. This is the, the sort of elephant in the room with brain injury. This is the one that everyone talks about as causing CTE. Um, and then anoxic brain injury. So anoxic brain injury is lack of oxygen to the brain, and that's the worst possible prognosis. Those are the patients who don't get better. They have persistent memory deficits very often after a brain injury. Sometimes these are patients who, who literally don't remember getting hit in the head. You'll have a patient who, you know, for example, get, gets you know, on their bike, gets hit by a bus, they're wearing a helmet or something like that, and they fall to the ground um, and they may lose consciousness for a moment or two, but they don't remember hitting their head at all. And maybe their helmet's not even damaged. Um, and then what happens is, is because when they went down, they broke something else, they were acutely hypotensive, they, they had no oxygen going to their brain, maybe for like a minute or two, but not very long. And then they wake up, and they are never the same. 
and they have memory deficits that are persistent, or they have a calculia where they can't calculate, um, and they, they have math problems, like they can't solve math problems for the rest of their life, and it's because of that. So you, you see what we call watershed infarcts and, and other infarcts that you may not initially suspect in someone, but they, they actually have a brain injury. So to complicate things further, so you've got, I think of brain injury as a salad. You know, like it's not one pathology. Someone gets hit in the head, they may have, you know, pick three, pick four, you know, make your salad however you like. But they, they have mixed pathophysiology. And there are all different kinds of things that can be going wrong. And the problem is, is each one of them is diagnosed differently and treated differently. And some of them are really hard to diagnose. Um, what else makes it complicated, right? There's something else that makes it complicated. No two brains are the same. No one brain is the same over time. So if you want to measure heart function, it's a piece of cake, right? It's a pump. You measure what comes in, you measure what comes out, you get your ejection fraction, you know your cardiac output, and boom, you know if you have heart failure, it's like easy as, you know, can be. But with the brain, you know, good luck with that because you can take two people who are highly functioning, you know, who have normal lives, you know, take siblings if you want, take identical twins if you like, and give them cognitive functioning tests and they'll score differently. And why is that? It's because people have different personalities even if they're identical genetically. Um, and then to make things even more complicated, no one brain is, is the same over time. So from the moment that you're born, you're starting to myelinate, right? And from the moment that you're born, you're starting to atrophy. And around the age of 35, 30 to 35, you stop myelinating. So that's pretty much your intellectual peak. Um, it's all downhill from there. But e essentially, wh whenever, whenever you're doing a test, you know, for, for brain function, you're trying to hit a moving target, right? Because you've got a system that's changing over time. You know, it's, it's going in one direction, uh, you know, up until a certain age, and then it's going in the other direction. So, so tests that require baselines are really not very ideal. Um, baselines vary from person to person, and they vary in the same person over time. So if you, you know, in, in schools, for example, they use, um, they use the um, impact test, right? So the impact test has seven different modalities. And they, you, with my son, my son plays football, so we'll, we can talk about that after. Um, so w with, with my son, he has to go in and he has to take the impact test. And they, they give it to them over their lunch period. So they, they say all the kids who are playing football have to go in and take the impact test over their lunch period. And so my, my son goes into the room and he says, you know, m my mom says this test is reliably unreliable. And, and, and the, the, the trainer says to him, well, you still have to do it. So he sits there and he fills in all the dots as fast as he possibly can. And then he goes and eats his lunch. And then, you know, I get a phone call two days later saying your, your son's test is unreliable. Um, and, and the problem is, is that if you give a test like that to a bunch of kids, you know, it's a function of how much effort they want to put into it. And my kid is probably an extreme example because he doesn't think it's a valid test. But, you know, there are other kids who are more interested in eating lunch or talking to their girlfriend or playing on their phone or doing whatever they want to do, and they're not going to want to take the test. And so is, you, any test that has poor validity measures is not a great test. And that's the problem with most um, functional neuropsych and cognitive testing. It's the validity measure. So to make things even more complicated, um, no two recoveries are the same. So I can take two identical genetic you know, twins and I can hit them both on the head um, and they may have different recovery rates. Why is that? Um, it, it may be due to environment. Um, with identical twins, it's not going to be due to genetics, but with, you know, any other group, it is going to be due to genetics. So this is Kevin Pierce. This is him not falling. Um, he's a professional snowboarder, and he was training for the Sochi Olympics, and he crashed. And when he crashed, um, they, they ended up making a movie called The Crash Reel about his recovery because he had a very severe brain injury. He was um, operated on it um, in, in Salt Lake City, and, uh, and then he recovered. Um, and th the thing about this movie is they show footage of him as a kid. And one of the things that they show is they show him climbing up on his high chair and jumping. And he's about, you know, 18 months or so or maybe two years old. And his parents are sitting there filming it, right? Um, and, and so you realize that the, the, the environment in which he was raised was highly conducive to risk-taking behaviors and development of resilience. And, you know, not every person has that environment. We, I was designing um, a clinical trial for pediatric brain injury recovery with a, a group of pediatricians. And one of the things that we talked about was how do we control for the neuroses of the parents? Um, 
you know, th these, these are hard things. You know, families can be enabling, and, and that, that can be a problem. So you, you have not only the genetic factors, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about the risk-taking behavior genes. Um, I'm sure that the genetics play a huge role, but also the, the environment. Um, and so to further complicate things, some people with brain injury were never hit in the head. Um, you know, you have blast injury, you have flexion extension injuries, where you can have shear, and it, they have no visible scars, right? And so that, that makes things even more complicated. Um, ultimately, neither imaging nor loss of consciousness tell the whole story, right? Imaging is going to give you this much. It's going to say, okay, there's a structural brain injury, there's a vascular problem, there's, a, there's something that we can see. Um, loss of consciousness is, is that circle. Um, where, you know, it overlaps somewhat, but not completely. And then there's the elephant in the room, which is physiologic brain injury. And the irony of this is that not only do we not know how big that circle is and how much it overlaps with the other circles, but we don't even know what it contains, right? Um, there are so many different pathophysiologies for brain injury that we don't understand um, that, that it can be difficult. Yet, we take all these patients, right? We take the, the patients with the salad, and you've got, you know, you've got your chicken salad on this side and your tuna salad on that side, and we put them all in the same clinical trial. Um, and that's really why the clinical trials fail, because we're not classifying the pathophysiology before we treat the patients. So how do we fix this? Where, what is the solution? Wh what is next for brain injury, and where are we going in the future? And I would argue that you have to have objective measures. You cannot have subjective measures for a system as complicated as the brain. It just doesn't work well that way. Um, and I would start with genetics, radiographic measures, serum markers, and eye tracking. So let's go through some of these a little bit. Um, genetics. So you've got your pre-injury genetic risk factors, and I call these the, the Kennedy genes or the risk-taking genes. So there are particular genes that make you more likely to climb mountains, um, for example. Um, people who engage in risk-taking behaviors are much, much more likely to have a brain injury. Um, I have a patient who um, the family has lost two members one from a kayaking accident and one from a biking accident. And, you know, I, I was talking to one of the, the children in that family, and she had just come back from doing an Ironman. And, and you know, you, you look at that family, and number one, you think, okay, they're very athletic people. But number two, you realize, you know, these people engage in risk-taking behaviors. It, she's much more likely to die of a brain injury than your, your average person off the street. Um, and, and so, you know, these are real problems. Um, then you have your immediate impact genes, things that um, control, you know, swelling in the brain right after an injury. You have your delayed impact genes, um, genes that control how you recover in the, you know, first couple of weeks after a brain injury. And then you have your long-term impact genes. So things like, for example, catechol O-methyltransferase, it turns over neurotransmitters, right? So if you can't turn over neurotransmitters, you're not going to recover from a brain injury as quickly. And nobody has control over that. You know, these are, these are things that we don't, sadly, we don't check them on our patients. So then we don't know what they are, and we don't know what the patients will respond to. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I've, I've, I've worked some with the NFL, and one of the things that I talked to um, Jeff Miller, who's their senior VP for health, um, about was doing genetic testing on football players. And there's no way they'll ever do it because the lawyers would just veto it. But the problem is, is that if you knew exactly what the genetic makeup was of each person and what their susceptibilities were, you would have better capacity to treat them. Um, you would have, you know, increased ability to target a therapeutic appropriately. Um, so let's talk a little bit about radiology. So um, I'd said genetics, radiographic measures, serum markers, and eye tracking. Um, genetics we don't do clinically, and that's unfortunate. Um, radiology, obviously we do CT scans, and that's the standard of care. But what is the future? Where are we going with this? Um, some of you may have seen this article in the Star Tribune about brain mapping research. So that's Camille um, Ugerbill. He's one of the you know, most significantly NIH-funded researchers who does brain mapping. Um, and what is it? It's where you look at tracts in the brain and you quantitate their integrity. And so we've collaborated, our laboratory has collaborated with um, Dr. Ugerbill, and you know, basically what they've done is they've put the algorithms on the web so that they're open access and anyone can download them and then you can analyze your images. 
Um, and so my graduate student in my lab, um, she's a graduate student in bioinformatics, she has written formulas that basically quantitate um, things like fractional anisotropy, which tells you about microstructural integrity, main diffusivity, which tells you about cellular breakdown, and axial diffusivity, um, that tells you about axonal damage. And then what we've done is we've looked at, um, this was a poster that she presented at a recent meeting, we've looked at trauma patients compared to controls, and we've quantitated, and these are, these are their mechanisms of injury for this particular study, and we've quantitated where they are with those particular algorithms, and you can actually measure. So you can see changes in fractional anisotropy, mean diffusivity, um, mode um, of anisotropy, and um, radial diffusivity. And then what you'll be able to do ultimately is you'll be able to figure out if someone has a brain injury in a very objective way. And you're not relying on radiology to tell you, you know, hey, this is this and this is that. Um, so I think that this is one mechanism in the future by which we will ultimately have objective measures. Um, and you won't need a radiologist. You won't, you won't, what, what they're doing with these connectome studies is, you know, for example, we're looking at brain injury, but you've got 15 other people looking at, say, dementia or at Parkinson's or at other different neurologic conditions. And they're going to create an algorithmic atlas of the brain where you're going to be able to tell. And you're not, you're not going to need an interpreter to in interpret the films. You're going to just basically use machine learning to, um, to quantitate all the different algorithms and then tell you exactly what's wrong. You know, this is this and this is that. You know, this patient has Parkinson's, this patient has Parkinson's and a brain injury, you know. So, you, so you'll be able to quantitate, and I think that that will change things. And I don't think that this is that far away. I think we're probably looking at, say, in the next five years. Um, next, serum markers. So some of you probably saw the news. Uh, I think it came out in um, February, a couple of weeks after the Super Bowl, um, about GFAP and UCHL1 being cleared as serum biomarkers for um, prediction of a positive CAT scan. I think the, the FDA press release actually said um, aid in the diagnosis of concussion or something like that, but what the FDA actually cleared it for was detection of a positive CAT scan. So what are serum biomarkers and how are they going to help us? Um, so here you have a neuron, right? And then you have a number of markers that are expressed on the body of the neuron and on the axon of the neuron and the axon terminals. Um, when the neuron gets stretched or pulled or damaged in any way, what happens is some of those biomarkers cross the blood-brain barrier, they leak out into the bloodstream, and then you can detect them. And the nice thing is, is you can not only detect them acutely, like right after it happens, but you can look for antibodies to them later, and that can tell you if a brain injury occurred in the past. And that's kind of a big deal because right now we have absolutely no way of figuring that out. Um, and you can not only tell if it's neurons, but you can also tell, you know, glial cells, and you can tell if there's vascular injury. And so you should be able to classify the nature of injury on the basis of serum markers. And the largest study that's doing this is called Track TBI. Our lab participates in that. It's a multi-center NIH-funded prospective study. Um, they just got eight million dollars from the NFL, so they're they're extremely well connected. Um, it's run by Jeff Manley out of UCSF, and they've recruited about 3,000 patients, and they're looking at serum markers as a, as a marker for injury. Um, these are some of the examples of particular markers. So UCHL1 was one of them that was FDA cleared, um, as well as GFAP, um, glial fibrillary um, acidic protein. Um, and so as these markers become more readily available, what we'll, we should be able to do is use them to classify the nature of injury. So this is a patient who um, sustained a brain injury um, and was crushed, actually. And uh, he was actually a workers' comp patient. Um, so this was his serum marker level compared to a control um, at 0 0.6 hours post-injury, 24 hours post-injury, and two weeks post-injury. So you can see his UCLHL1 was massively elevated and slowly came down over two weeks. Um, it peaked at about 24, at, sorry, at 0 0.6 hours. His GFAP peaked at 24 hours, um, and his S100B um, peaked early. And so what you can do is you can imagine that you'll be able to detect brain injury um, sort of in a way that's um, very objective. And that's, that's what one of the things that our lab is working on. And what we're trying to do is distinguish, um, like for example, a velocity-associated brain injury from a non-velocity-associated brain injury. So if you have a patient who bleeds in their head spontaneously, 
versus is in a high-speed car accident, you can look at the serum markers and, um, you know, we look at S100B, we look at UCHL1, and we look at GFAP, and you can see that the patterns of expression are different. Um, and so one might imagine a future when we can classify the nature of the brain injury on the basis of these markers in combination with other things like radiology. So you can build machine learning algorithms that allow you to collect data um, you know, from, from radiology plus serum markers and put them together and then figure out what's wrong. Um, and then the next measure that I would, you know, mention is eye tracking. So what's so great about eye tracking? So right now we don't have a functional physiologic measure that tells us how the brain works, right? I mean, if you, if you want to measure kidney function, right? Kidney is a filter. So you measure the, the concentration of the protein in the blood, you measure the concentration of the protein in the urine, in the urine, and then you compare them, and you know how well your filter works, right? Well, with your brain, you have no way of doing that, right? Because the brain has so many different functions, and you have different levels of baseline in normal, healthy people that it becomes very, very difficult. You add the volitional component to the task, and then it becomes almost impossible. So you have to pick a brain function that's less volitional. Well, what's a brain function that's less volitional? It's eye movement, right? Because you think about where you want to look, but you don't think about the fact that your eye movements are coordinated. Um, and they're coordinated in both horizontal and vertical planes by separate mechanisms. So you can actually tell which pathways are disrupted by looking at how the eye movements are not coordinated when they're not coordinated. Um, and the nice thing is, is all of the coordination happens in the brainstem. So you're not conscious of it. You don't think about it, right? And then when something's non-volitional, then it becomes a better objective measure. Um, how old is the idea of using eye movements to detect brain injury? Well, it dates back to the earliest surgical treatise, um, which is written around 1700 BC, based on texts written around 3000 BC. So it's about 5,000 years old, this idea of using eye movements as an in indicator of brain injury. And you know, the irony is, and I was, I was just discussing this with your commissioner, is that people have used radiology to define brain injury only in, since about 1970, only in the last 50 years when CAT scan came out. Because prior to that, there was great awareness that brain injury was something that um, you detected on physical exam. And if, if you look back in the, in the 1950s and 1960s, there are textbooks written on the use of eye movements to detect and, and quantitate the severity of brain injury um, because that's what they had. They didn't have advanced imaging, so that's how we defined brain injury. And after CT came out, we basically r relied less and less and less on physical exam and more and more and more on imaging. Um, so our algorithm is basically like this, where someone watches um, cartoons or you know a music video or you know TV, a, a sports clip or whatever they want, and it plays inside an aperture, and the aperture moves on a computer screen. Um, so it, as the aperture is going around the screen, it goes around the perimeter of the screen. Their eyes follow it, and it, it goes about 10 seconds per perimeter side. So it goes 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds, and it goes around five times. So it's 40 seconds per cycle, five cycles is 200 seconds. Um, and we measure pupil position at 500 hertz or 500 times per second. So we get 100,000 data points. Um, and, and so we record the eye movements at 100,000 data points over 200 seconds. Um, and then we, we take that data and we look at how coordinated the eye movements are. And there are several ways of looking at the data. We can look at what's called a box plot, which is just the Cartesian coordinates x, y of the pupils over time. We can look at conjugacy, which is how well they're moving together in the horizontal and vertical planes separately. Um, and then we can look at the time course, which is how well they're moving together over time. And what we find is that when someone has, so the simplest case is when someone, you cut the nerve, right, going to the eye. So if you have a severed third cranial nerve, you, your eye doesn't move up and down because their third nerve moves your eye up and down. If you have a severed sixth nerve, your eye doesn't move out to the side because that nerve's not working. And so what you can do is you can look at when someone has swelling in their brain that affects one of the nerves, right? So here's a patient who has bleeding on the surface of their brain. The third nerve does not look squashed, but two out of five cycles are, are flat. 
Then the bleeding gets worse, the nerve looks squashed, and five out of five cycles are flat. Then you drain the, the hemorrhage. The radiographically, there's not a complete recovery, but five out of five cycles are back to normal. So physiologically, the brain has recovered. Um, here's another example, a patient who has a skull fracture from a fall, tiny little bleed on the surface of the brain, and this is an acute injury. I mean, it just happened, right? So five out of five cycles are completely flat, and you also have what we call hypermetric saccades, where the patient gets halfway around watching the film, and they can't control their eye movements, because in that particular domain, they have, they have loss of control, and it happens on five out of five cycles. And the interesting thing is after you've drained the, sub the epidural here in this case, and the patient's completely better, seven days later, they still have hypermetric saccades in the same places that they had them preoperatively. So you have a physiologic measure of, of brain injury that, that not reflecting what you see on the imaging, it's telling you how the brain feels. It's a measure of how the brain feels, not how it looks. And this is the patient at 11 days and 35 days post-op. The patient came back to work two months after the injury. Um, so supratentorial affects cranial nerve three, affects box height, infratentorial affects cranial nerve six. So you have a patient with a brain tumor on the back of the skull, pressing on the sixth nerve, the box goes narrow. You take the brain tumor out, the box goes back to normal. Um, another patient with a brain tumor, this time it's affecting the other sixth nerve, so the other box is narrow. You take the brain tumor out and the box goes back to normal. So what happens when you get hit in the head, right? When you get hit in the head, the pressure in your skull rises. And so it slows down the function of all of the nerves, but the nerves that have longer intracranial courses and thinner are affected more selectively, right? So your height times width of your box is your function of cranial nerve three times cranial nerve six. So it's the area of the box. Um, and you can look at intracranial pressure. This is measured through a, a monitoring device that's placed into the skull um, and as a function of um, area of the box. And you can see that the higher the pressure in your skull, the lower the area of the box. And that's your left eye and that's your right eye. So you can use this as a proxy for measuring intracranial pressure. So you can measure the pressure in the head by assessing the eye movements, which is you know, really pretty cool. Um, here's a patient with neurosarcoidosis. She's got hydrocephalus. You can see it on MRI. And then this is her eye tracking pre-op. And then you treat it, and she, she gets better. Um, so what happens when you have a concussion then, when you have a brain injury? It's a, a summary of the, you create a metric, which you call brain injury associated ocular motility dysfunction. That's a summary metric that captures all the different types of problems that can happen that are associated with brain injury. Um, and then these are examples. And I won't go through all of them, but ultimately a normal box score is less than three. This patient goes from 21 to eight to two to zero. Um, and then you, you, what you wanna do is you wanna create a biomarker for brain injury. So you can, um, you can create what's called an ROC curve, which tells you your sensitivity and your specificity of your biomarker. Um, you define concussion as high symptoms and low standardized assessment of cognition. And then you can create a model that tells you your sensitivity and specificity, and it turns out you have a misclassification rate of 10%. So, you know, you have a, a high misclassification rate, relatively speaking, but that's because the, the technology is not yet perfect. Um, and, you know, as the cameras get more accurate, you're going to improve your um, sensitivity and specificity. Um, these are other examples. This is in kids, 64 pediatric subjects, a mean of 22 weeks post-injury. So my lab just published this. This was actually research that was done at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in, um, in Philadelphia by Tina Master, who's the head of their concussion center, um, and the AUC was 0.854. Um, and here, it's a cross-validation sample of 75 subjects. Um, and then what you can do, then, is you can also quantitate specific aspects of ocular motor dysfunction that's associated with brain injury. So one of them is vergence dysfunction. Vergence is the ability to follow a point in time, right? So you're watching a tennis match bounce, 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 right? Your, your smooth pursuit vergence, right? Um, this is convergence, this is divergence, right? Um, and so you can look at how well you're able to verge. Um, and vergence dysfunction has been associated with brain injury. It's uh, one of the most frequently um, diagnosed on clinical exam. Um, and it's also associated with uh, football subconcussive head impacts. Um, this is data 
from 32 concussed pediatric subjects looking at a near point of convergence greater than six, and the, the ability of eye tracking to figure out whether or not a patient has an, a near point of convergence abnormality is, um, has an AUC of 0.81. <clears throat> So ultimately, you can take all this information. You can take the eye tracking, you can take the algorithmic analysis of the MRI, you can take the blood-based biomarkers, and you can take the CT scan. And you can analyze them all algorithmically using plain math, right? And put it all together and use machine learning to figure out how to classify the brain injury. And that will help solve the problem. Um, what's the difference between conventional you know, data analysis and machine learning. Conventional data analysis sort of s makes you understand the pathophysiology, right? It's understanding based, and that's it, it's the conventional way of doing science. Machine learning, you don't necessarily need to understand everything that the model is measuring, right? So eye tracking may be measuring clinical parameters that we don't understand. The radiology may be measuring clinical parameters that we don't understand. The serum markers may be measuring things that we don't understand. P pathophysiology that we have no idea exists. Maybe when you, you know, get hit in the head, something happens to your neurons that we don't understand pathophysiologically. But it results in a change in something, right? It results in a change in your radiographic measures, in your eye tracking, or in your serum markers. Um, and then you can collect that data, and, and you can... You can, un you can have a machine help you figure out what it means. Um, so the conventional approach is regular papers in medicine. Um, you know, an example would be the American College of Surgeons Surgical Risk Calculator. Machine learning, th that, that approach is things like automated car driving. So cars get safer the more automated cars there are, right? Because they, they learn. Image analysis, face recognition, voice recognition, um, you know, and, and so ultimately what you're going to have is you're going to be able to use machine learning to create tools that will diagnose brain injury completely independent of any doctor, right? Because you don't need a doctor to do the tests that I just told you. Um, and how is this going to change things? Well, if you look at where we are in life, Right now, our life expectancy, you know, in the United States, we're a wealthy, relatively wealthy country. We're, we're creeping up to above the 80s, right? Um, and as time progresses, we're going to go higher and higher, right? Um, and so you're going to have more and more older people living longer and longer, and those people are going to fall, and they're going to get brain injuries. Um, you're also looking at um, better understanding what causes um, neurodegenerative disease. So this was a paper that was published in Lancet um, last summer, and basically it showed that there were nine risk factors that accounted for 35% of your dementia risk. Um, and the single greatest risk factor, can you guys see it? It's kind of small on the slide. It's hearing loss, right? Middle age hearing loss was the single greatest risk factor. Um, sorry, um, low socioeconomic or low education level in early life was the single greatest risk factor followed by hearing loss in, in middle-aged um, life. So, you know, you can quantitate this with machine learning. You can figure out how to reduce your risks. Um, and, and that's really what we're going to do, is we're going to be able to tease out how to preserve um, neurologic function as people age. Uh, this was a paper that came out recently. I don't know if you guys saw it, but essentially certain medications were tied to a 30% higher dementia risk. How did they figure this out? 41,000 patients, 284,000 controls. That's machine learning. Um, and it turns out that amitriptyline, oxybutynin, and procyclidine increased your risk for dementia by a 30% risk. Um, and that's, that's a lot. So um, th this is what machine learning can do. So what does this mean for the acute and chronic effects of neurotrauma? What does this mean for the salad, right? It means that you're going to be able to reduce your risk of each of the consequences of these, you know, of paralysis, sorry, um, depression, suicidality, dizziness, headache, seizure, stroke, um, CTE, permanent neuro deficit. Um, and then ultimately, you're not going to need your doctor <laughs> anymore because I mean, you guys, I know you de Department of Labor and Industry, you guys are probably very concerned about labor. Um, you know, there's not going to be a labor shortage um, in medicine because you're not going to need doctors. Um, you're you're going to be able to do all this algorithmically. Some of you may have seen the news. Um, I think about two, three days ago, Apple got FDA clearance for their Apple Watch. 
So they now can detect your heart rate. Um, I find that absolutely terrifying. I don't want Apple to know my heart rate. Uh, but, but basically, it's the beginning. It's the beginning of, you know, consumer health care not driven by doctors, but driven by health tech companies that have nothing to do with medicine and don't really know that much about medicine. Um, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating area. So I got invited to give a talk at Google in June, and I'm going back in November as part of this Google Healthcare Scholars Program. And they are very, very interested in algorithmic analysis of brain function. Um, they are planning on moving into that space. And by moving into that space, I mean, you know, hiring 50 people and throwing $100 million at it. So, so it, it's, it's going to be an interesting area, um, era for in the future because, you know, what we know of as, you know, brain injury diagnosis is not going to be driven by doctors. We're way too slow. These, these companies move much, much faster. Um, and so what does that mean? I think it means the end of the conventional payer payee system where, you know, when a patient gets hurt, um, the insurance company then says, okay, you can have X or Y as your diagnostic. You can have a CT scan, but not an MRI, or you can have, maybe you can get a CT and an MRI, but, you know, they're, they're not going to pay for, say, serum markers or eye tracking or, you know, algorithmic MRI or something like that, or, you know, high Tesla, three Tesla scanners. But it, that won't matter because Google will have all of those things, right? Google will have, you know, and or Google will have eye tracking through your Sam, your what do they call it, Android phone. I kept calling it an iPhone when I was there. Um, there, <laughs> it was a bad mistake. So th th they have an eye tracking camera in your Android phone now. So you know, how's that going to change things? It's going to change things pretty dramatically. Um, and you know, the other part of this is that the some of these companies are merging. So Amazon, Amazon Berkshire Hathaway, and J.P. Morgan all collaborated and they started this independent company that is allegedly going to be free from profit making incentives to provide health care for their employees right and then they uh, appointed atul gawande as ceo of this company he's the guy who wrote the book complications so what's going to happen here is companies like this they're going to eliminate the insurers they don't need to have insurers when they can self-insure because they they employ enough people that it makes it worth their while um, and if you look at the numbers, you know, for employment for Amazon, for example, you're talking about 300,000 people. Um, you know, Microsoft, Google, these these companies are not small companies, um, and so this is going to change the the climate of healthcare a lot. Um, and you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens to the hospital system as we know it. Um, this is the this is a figure from the CNS, and I apologize, it's a little shaded, but essentially what it shows is that. Um, the growth of physicians between 1970 or 1980 and 2015 has been about, you know, maybe 100% or so. But the growth of administrators over that same time period has been about 3,000%. So the vast majority of the healthcare dollar is going to people who, I don't know what they do. You know, they, they, <laughs> they make rules and the rest of us have to follow them. Um, and then they, they, have, they hire additional people to enforce the rules and then, you know, set up compliance testing and all this stuff. And, you know, it's, it's, I, I could talk about that for another hour. But the, the reality is, is that that bubble is going to burst because the Googles and the Medtronics and the, the, the big companies of the world are going to pop it. And then that'll be really interesting to see, you know, when, th when that happens. Um, so ultimately, I think we will have a trial for brain injury that succeeds when we can classify the injury appropriately using objective obsessors, assessors and we have sensitive outcome measures. Um, I think that's all I have, so I, can, I think I might have a little time for a few questions. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I think that it will have, it will be a direct-to-consumer device at some point. Um, 
you know, my disclosures, I listed the fact that I'm part of a company. So I co-founded a company called Oculogica um, that is developing eye tracking technology. And um, we've been talking, obviously, to Google and to other companies about um, commercialization. And what we've found is that some companies are interested in the medical market and other companies are interested in the consumer market. Um, from an FDA perspective, you have to be in the medical market first. Um, otherwise, you can't make claims. Because the, the, for, for FDA clearance for eye tracking, um, the discussion has been focused on interpretation of the results by a physician. But, uh, you know, ultimately, I, I see this becoming, you know, direct to consumer. And then the question is, is, well, what does the consumer do with the information? And that will be sort of the, the next big question to answer. I think it's, it's definitely something that will happen. Yeah, did you have a question back there? Oh, I'm sorry, did you want to, oh, sorry, yeah, at, at the microphone, sorry. No. Yeah. Know what I'm talking about? No. What did you see on 60 Minutes? Uh, I was asking. <laughs> okay. Um, there was um, a demonstration of a gentleman that had hooked himself up electronically brain to the brain, mm -hmm. to the internet. And there was a demonstration where an individual asked him a question, mm -hmm. a math question, that couldn't be calculated in your head. He claimed to have access to the internet, and he was able to think it and access the internet electronically via brainwaves mm -hmm. and give him the answer that he had accessed from the internet. Well, I, I missed that 60 Minutes show. It does sound interesting. My, my suspicion is, and I, I, don't, I didn't see it, so I don't know. My suspicion okay. is, is they're probably using quantitative EEG, okay. where you can measure electrical activity yes. in different areas of the brain. Yes, that's... Because most of the sensors that people have developed that um, measure electrical... Like, there's a couple of different companies that are doing that. There's a company called Alminda that's based out of Israel. There's one called BrainScope. Um, that's from, I think they're New Jersey or Massachusetts or something like that. There's another one in Chicago. Um, there are a couple of companies that are using quantitative EEG to do those kinds of things. Um, and I think it's an interesting area. Some people are marketing it as um, a biofeedback technology for brain injured people. And I don't know how well it works, but I've, I've talked to one patient who tried it and she was extremely happy with it. I have no idea if it works or not. That's a very small N. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yes, question over there. Okay, I have a microphone. Okay. Um, I had gone to a prior conference where you spoke, and I had brought up the situation of an individual who was working, and a box hit them in the back of the neck, the, head, the shoulder, and uh, this person had immediate five minutes of clear fluid coming out of their nose. Mm -hmm. And she had mentioned it to me. I wasn't put on the case till like weeks to a month later. Now, I would think that that was possibly cerebral spinal fluid. That sounds reasonable. Yes. yes. So what kind of advice would you give employers about employees that get struck in the, the neck, the head, and they have clear fluid coming out of the... Um, Nose, can it also come out of the ears? Yeah, I mean, you so, can have CSF leaks if when you have skull brace fractures. What kind of advice would you give to the employers when there is such an incident at work? Well, generally speaking, those people need to seek medical care. So, you know, if, if not the emergency room, then, you know, something relatively soon. Yeah, this person, the employer had him go back to work. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, and I've talked about this to different doctors, and they said, well, you know, something will happen. Somebody will die, and then they'll change it. I really would like to avoid that step. 
<laughs> so I just want to make make it yeah. known that if someone does have an injury like that, to take yeah. it seriously and absolutely at yeah. least not put them back to heavy work. All <laughs> right, sounds thank reasonable. you. Yeah. Yes. For a question about um, headaches. Yeah. Um, a lot of uh, our clients seem to you know go through all the protocols for rehab uh, post TBI and but the headaches continue yeah when you were talking about that um, cortical depression yeah. abnormalities I'm wondering is that something that can sort of carry on that isn't being treated or looked at yeah especially when you know they uh, there's been neck treatment there's been you know many kinds of medications tried and the headaches go on and then uh, it, it sounds like you're saying, yeah, there, there's a possibility that that could. Yeah, if the headaches are due to cortical spreading depression abnormalities, they they have to see someone who specializes in treating brain injury. So, like the I I just know the people at Hennepin, like Min Graf and Sarah Roxwald, Brian Tonkin. They they know how to diagnose and treat these things. Um, I'm sure there are other places that also know how to do it, but those are the people that I refer to because they're my home base. Okay, and uh, do there is there any treatment? It, the treatment then comes from like well, Dr. that Roxwell. that comes from correcting the electrolyte abnormality. Uh, so typically, you give magnesium and you you correct magnesium levels, and then you can give things like Lyrica um, to help. But it it really it has to be accurately diagnosed, you know, and uh, and that's the hard part. In cases where it's genetic, where you have a susceptibility, it can be very difficult to treat. So do you, um, d does, does HCMC have a good protocol then for, for assessment? Yeah. For that kind I of mean, thing? I mean, okay. I have tremendous respect for my colleagues there. They Great. are very good. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Okay. I think that's it. So thank you very much.